Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight we're going to be heading into the middle of nowhere, for some truly terrifying tales. The first story is in fact, one of my favourite if not my favourite all time story, so be sure to listen attentively. But for now it's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. To specify, the story I would like to share is one that's been passed down to me from my late grandfather. The circumstances are so unusual, so unlike anything I've ever heard, that it's been in the back of my mind for nearly 20 years, ever since it was first told to me when I was a child. My granddad was a great talker and storyteller in his own way, and my family agrees that he wouldn't mind if I shared it with others. First, I'll need to give you a little background. My granddad was born in the early 20s in a dirt floor two room farmhouse in rural South Carolina, an only child of a sharecropper during the Great Depression. He was a premature baby, and his parents, already having lost one infant, were understandably protective of him. I'm sure they were relieved and very happy that he was a strong and healthy child, albeit with an incredible amount of wanderlust. Restless and energetic, he almost always finished his chores as quickly as he could, so that he could take up his little fishing rod and roam to his heart's content. Back then, even horse-drawn carts were a rarity on those long-gone dirt roads. Cars were practically unheard of in that part of the country in those days, Disliking horses, but still greatly desiring to put as much distance between home and himself as he could in the span of an afternoon. My granddad had little choice other than to walk, and walk he did. He combed through miles of woods, fields and swamplands, barefoot as the day he came into the world. Heedless of brambles or snakes, they wouldn't bother him if he didn't bother them. As much as he enjoyed it, it was a lonely business. His father was a hail man, but with acres of land to help tend as well as livestock, he hardly had time to join his son on his walks. Sometimes one of the local boys would go with him, but it wasn't often. So being practically kin to everyone within a 30 mile radius, my granddad took up on the grand old southern tradition of going visiting. One of his favourite places to go was to Uncle Peter's. Uncle Peter lived on one of the branches of the lake that stretched across a goodly portion of the country. It was a tiny shack, hardly more than a shanty, and barely big enough to fit both him and his spinster sister, Henrietta, but they made do. Now, Uncle Peter loved to talk about as much as he loved to fish, so when he would spot my granddad coming up the dirt track towards the house, he'd put whatever he was working on aside. Aunt Henrietta was prone to giving him the stink eye for this, but she was fond of my granddad too, so she never said anything. It became a tradition of sorts for my grandfather to put a spare shirt in a sack, along with a treat of some kind that his mother made, and head off for Uncle Peter's every other weekend. He did this for years, right up until he married my grandmother. Usually it was about dark when he'd set off, meaning it was well after sunset before he got there. The distance between his house and Uncle Peter's being in the reckoning of about six or seven miles. Grandad tended to stay through Sunday, heading home after evening supper, which tended to be on the table well after dark. Suffice to say, there wasn't much to be afraid of back then other than the local wildlife. And as I said before, as long as you minded your own business, they minded theirs, He'd been walking through the countryside at night all his life. He was comfortable, and felt very safe. As became habit through the years, Grandad kissed Aunt Henrietta goodbye, shook Uncle Peter's hand, and started home at a brisk pace. It was autumn, so the air was pleasantly cool, a warm relief from summer's oppressively humid heat. He said that there was a full moon that night, and when he would walk out in the open, it was fairly well lit. He could easily see where he was going. 
The dirt track that led away from Uncle Peter's shack meandered through a bit of marshland before it ended at a wider road. Usually he didn't take that route, unless he felt like a bit of a wonder, since cutting through the fields and woodland was a straighter shot back to his parents' farmhouse, and the road slithered and slunk its way around the far side of the lake, before curving back in the direction of home. That night, however, with the moonlight and the refreshing nip in the air, Grandad felt the urge to do a bit of meandering. Turning at the end of the path, he stepped onto the road barefoot as a jaybird and softly whistling to himself. The route was so familiar that he hardly paid any attention to the surroundings, letting his feet do most of the work while he occupied himself with other thoughts. Before he knew it, he was approaching the lake. The water was calm that night, dark but still. He slowed down a little, wanting to watch the way the light rippled and shimmered gently. It was such a pretty sight that he nearly missed what was standing not far up the road. At first, it was just a silhouette, a tall and solid looking shadow that seemed to be facing the water. Grandad thought it might have been a trick of the light initially. He'd walked through a cemetery once in the middle of the night, and thought he'd seen a soldier riding a white horse until he'd gotten closer and realized it was just a large dew-dropped spider web. As he grew closer, he quickly realized it wasn't his eyes. There was something standing on the side of the road. In fact, it was a man. He could tell by the build, broad-shouldered and narrow at the hip, and he could tell by the clothes, even in the moonlight. It was evident that the man wore a dark suit that did not fit him well. A shapeless hat was on his head, causing his form to appear elongated and odd-looking. From the distance of several feet, Grandad could see the shine of good shoes, polished until they'd picked up the water's gleam. The man was standing close to the water, so close in fact, that the waves were lapping at his expensive-looking shoes. The lake's shifting reflection softly illuminated his face, and Grandad could make out the strong features that had been weathered with time and toil. The lines around his mouth and eyes were distinctive as he smiled. That was when Grandad realized that the man was smiling at him. In fact, the man had been staring at him just as long or longer as Grandad had been doing the same. Quickly remembering his manners, he greeted the man politely. The man's expression didn't change, and his head turned to follow my granddaddy's movement as he stopped on the other side of the road. A little unnerved, my grandfather stood awkwardly for a long moment, waiting for what he thought would be the appropriate amount of time for a reply. The man didn't speak. His face never changed. But he slowly brought his hand up and made a beckoning motion with his fingers, silently asking my granddad to come closer. Grandad shook his head. No, sir, I can't stay and talk. I've got to get home. You have a nice night. Dipping his head, my granddad started walking again, passing the strange man with a slightly quicker pace than he'd been walking before. Feeling that he was being watched, he stopped again a little further up the road, he turned to look back at the man, to see he had turned around so that he was now facing the direction that my granddad was going, still staring at him. But now he was waist deep in the water. Confused and shocked, granddad could only gape at the man as he stood in the lake. That same grin on his face as he lifted his hand and beckoned again, shaking his head quickly, my granddad repeated what he'd said before. The words were out of his mouth before he could think about how weird they sounded now. No, sir, I can't stay and talk. I've got to get home. You have a nice night. He whipped around and started walking even faster up the road, listening for the sounds of splashing or footsteps behind him. But there was nothing. And that was when it struck him. He'd never heard a sound. No splash, no drip, no scuffle of shoes against dirt. 
silence. Closing in on the trees, he felt a shiver run down his back as the feeling of being watched washed over him. He froze on the spot. Everything in him was telling him to just keep walking and not stop until he was through his mother's kitchen door. But there was an even stronger urge to turn around, to look back one more time. The compulsion was too much to resist. He turned again to look at the lake. The man was still there. Only now he was further in. The water was up to his shoulders now and he was still smiling. Even from the distance of several yards in the dark, Grandad somehow knew the man was still smiling. There was movement, and he saw the man lift his hand a third time, motioning for him to come back, to come closer, to come into the water. Grandad wasn't sure which, or even if it was any of those things, and he never found out. Without a word, he turned to face the trees and walked away. He walked the seven miles home unnerved and perplexed. And for the next 80 years until his death at the age of 91, he never figured out who the man was, why he was there, or what he wanted. Over and over again he told us that story. The encounter clearly haunted him. It haunts me. I shudder to think what would have happened had my granddad actually gotten close to the man, or lingered by the lake that night. But the one thing that has stuck out in my mind about his experience more than anything is that the man stood almost neck deep in water and didn't even make a ripple. My grandfather's company does timber and mining and was setting up an office in a relatively remote part of a third world country and found a house that was dirt cheap, even for third world country standards. Obviously there was a catch. The villagers in that area told him not to purchase it since the house was haunted and everyone who had ever lived there had died violently. He decided it just had to be superstitious nonsense and bought it anyway. So the guy setting up the office will live on the top floor of the house with his family and the lower floor is for the office. He moved in with his wife and three kids. Anyway, my grandfather suddenly got no news from him for the longest time. Since this was in a remote part of a third world country, he wasn't too worried. He just assumed they lost power or something. He finally contacted the local police to go check on the guy, since he was completely unreachable. They found everyone dead. Apparently the guy ended his life after his kids and wife with a machete. He actually hacked himself to death. And it wasn't quick. Everyone was hacked, including the guy himself. The description of this scene had to have been an exaggeration, since I'm assuming the sight of five bodies, including three kids, was scary enough to make people see things. So I won't bother putting it here since I'm not sure what's true, and there were details that people could not have possibly witnessed. Let's just say I stopped paying attention after I heard the phrase, magic machete. I was told the entire room was covered in blood, including the ceiling. Some people were saying the blood on the ceiling had to have gotten there because of the spirits throwing the body around. I had to explain about blood pressure and got tons of weird looks. Now the weirdest part, if this isn't weird enough, was that he managed to barricade the door with the bed with his wife and kids on it. And it is one of those gigantic old beds that's extremely hard to move. The locals say that it's evidence he was possessed by spirits. I say moving to the middle of nowhere in some third world country drove the guy nuts and crazy people can do all sorts of crazy stuff and even perform feats of strength. Anyway, my grandfather had to pay a few bribes to make sure nothing gets to the press, not hard in the middle of nowhere, about the entire thing and get the police to classify the deaths as natural. No idea how they explained that. He tried getting other volunteers to set the office up, Eventually, even if they hadn't heard all the gory details because of my grandfather's gag order, everyone knew the previous guy died. No one volunteered. He promoted one guy, gave him a fancy title and told him he's in charge of setting up that office. That guy quit.
I used to work as a housekeeper for this company. They would assign me to different houses in the area we were hiring. I had this one job at a house that was just a few towns over one night. I was reluctant to go since it was late, but I knew an old back road that would cut the driving time in half. It used to be an old logging road, and there are tons of them here in Oregon that can be handy shortcuts to places. One downside was the road was small, windy, and if you got into a crash, you'd basically be in the middle of nowhere surrounded by forest. I'm not sure it was completely legal to drive on one either. So anyway, I was driving down the road, groggy and tired, when I felt a small collision on my truck. I, of course, pulled over to inspect the damage and talked to the driver, who had seemingly come out of nowhere. He pulled up behind me. I got out and walked over to him and asked if he was okay. I was about three feet from the car, and I could see him sitting there, but he wasn't getting out. It was winter and night, so everything was pitch black, and I could barely see anything. But I knew there was a figure there. It was freezing cold and I was just getting creeped out, so I told him since there was barely any damage, I was just going to go. As I was heading back to my car, I heard his door open behind me. I turned around and saw him standing there. He was tall and had on a large black coat and baggy jeans. I stepped towards him and noticed something that made my heart sink. His hands were white skinned, but his face looked dark. I squinted and realized he was wearing black makeup on his face. This scared me even more because I was thinking he was wearing blackface. And for the record, I'm black and he had followed me out here in the middle of nowhere to harm me. I turned and started my car, when I felt the cold tip of a gum press on the back of my head. I was ready to cry at this point, thinking I was going to die alone out here because of the colour of my skin. I ended up trying to reason with him, but I could barely choke out my words, as I told him he didn't have to do this. Something surprising then happened. The guy started to cry as well. And just then he jumped in his car and sped off. Maybe I should have tried to see the license plate, but at that moment I just got in my car, drove home and called my parents. I never ever in my entire life thought I'd narrowly escape being the victim of what was possibly a hate crime. I'm glad this guy had a change of heart or whatever you want to call his reasoning for sparing me. I was house sitting for my parents who live in the actual middle of nowhere. The closest neighbor they have is about a mile away. My parents had taken their dogs with them on vacation to the beach. So it was an eerie and silent house to be in. It was the kind of quiet that you wouldn't want to turn off the TV or you would be faced with nothing but the eerie sounds of your breath and footsteps. On one completely pitch black night, void of any moon, I stepped on the back porch for a quick smoke before bed. As I reached the bottom of the steps, I pulled out a cigarette from the pack and fumbled for my lighter. As I flicked the wheel, the glow of the small flame briefly lit up my surroundings. In that split second of brief illumination, it became apparent I was not alone. In the few seconds it took my brain to process the dimly lit image, I realized that I had just momentarily seen a massive brown haired four legged beast eating from one of the dog's bowls by the steps leading from the porch into the house. And I mean, massive, twice the size of me at least, covered in some dirty brown human like hair from front to back. I didn't make out its head, but I knew from the glimpse of its torso that it was something I've never seen in the wild. As I stood there in fear of what was standing not three feet from me, unseen in the blackness of night, it lets out some kind of deep guttural grunt and plods off into the woods, shaking the porch as it runs away, leaving me scared and shaking in the pitch black dark with a still unlit cigarette hanging from my mouth. Needless to say, I ran inside, turned on every light and hid in the most interior room of the house like any grown adult man would. My brain couldn't process what it might be, but my imagination was filling all the blanks with whatever scary beast could be lurking out in the woods, 
just a few feet from my parents' back door, waiting to eat me. A few weeks later, I finally found out there were some reports that some of those giant feral pigs had moved onto my parents' land. No giant scary monster thing, just some overgrown hairy pig looking for a meal. Let me give you a bit of backstory. I live in the Netherlands, roughly three kilometers from the German border. My family is really big, and most of them from my dad's side of the family are all farmers or butchers. The farm that my dad owned has been in my family for almost 160 years and has had a lot of bad things happen to it in its long past. Like in the 1920s, two people who worked there as helpers on the farm got into a fight and one killed the other. We have the start of a really big bog on our property and throughout living there, family members, as far as I know, all children, drowned in the early 1900s. During World War II, my family helped a lot of people through that same bog because it was really dangerous if you didn't know the way. A lot of German soldiers, as well as ordinary Dutch people, drowned there. The Germans found out we were helping them and executed my granddad's father and a couple of his brothers to make an example of them. A lot of stable fires throughout its history that you can't explain. So like I said, there are plenty of odd occurrences that have happened here. I'm going to share with you a list of stories in chronological order. The first. When me and one of my sisters were younger at the time, my dad had next to the house a large field of Christmas trees that were for sale. So it was, for six-year-old me, the perfect hiding place for hide-and-seek, because it's a maze of trees. My cousin, who was 17 at the time, was searching for us, and it's me, my sister, hiding. So we went naturally into the field with the Christmas trees. After what for a small child felt like an eternity, we gave up and went looking for my cousin. Me and my sister thought we saw him through the window in one of the very old stables looking at us. So we run towards the stable with the only entrance slash exit in our sight at the time when we run towards it. Surprisingly, there was no one there. At that moment, our cousin came from behind the main house that was behind us so he could never have been there. And at the time, we were the only three on the farm because he was babysitting us. We asked him if he was in the stable and he said no. So who the hell was that? On to the second story. When I was eight, we already had six brothers and sisters with me being the oldest. So we had to make room. Me, my sister below me and my brother below my sister had the room up in the attic. Throughout growing up, we always felt when we were trying to sleep that our toes were being pinched. At first, we always thought it was just one of us goofing around, but it wasn't. When I was younger, I had sleep paralysis a lot. And at the time, of course, I did not know what it was, only that it was scary. I realized later what it was because it happened always in the same scary Sesame Street dream I had. I had that dream so many times while growing up that when I had that dream, I realized I was in a dream and somehow woke myself up. But I would then have sleep paralysis. Why am I sharing this? Because one of those times it was different. I did not have that dream. I just woke up in a really awkward, turned around, backwards, painful way. A feeling of a very cold hand smushing my head into the pillow. It was very hard to breathe. Luckily for me, my sister woke up to go to the toilet, and when she hit the light, she screamed because I was laying so weirdly. My sister and brother told my dad, and when my dad came up, whatever it was, the moment the door opened, I could move. And I know some people in the comments are going to say it was sleep paralysis, but believe me, I know the difference. This was very different, like the cold hand which I'd never felt before. It started out with that scary Sesame Street dream, like it usually always does. But that's what I think. The third story happened when I was 11. 
It was snowing very hard the night before. I was helping my dad around the farm. Nobody went to the old stables. But there was a track of footprints going out of the stables. No tracks at all going towards the stables, only out. No one went near the stables at that time because, like I said, you would have to have been seen in the snow. And it was snowing heavily the night before. My dad and my mum found this so weird that my dad went to follow the tracks with me because the tracks were leading over to a field towards the bog. I was very excited because me and my brothers and sisters are forbidden from going in there because it's very dangerous. We disobeyed my dad once and went in there and my sister got stuck. She was chest deep in and I was holding her so she wouldn't go any deeper. My brother ran for my dad, everything was okay but we got such a hard ass whooping that it left such a big impression on our young minds that nobody was even thinking of crossing the old man again for fear of his wrath. We followed it deep into the bog and it led towards the frozen water. Like just frozen enough to maybe hold a small animal. Definitely not a grown man or even a toddler. I don't know if spirits leave tracks, but we don't know what that was. If there were a track towards the old stables and a track out, it would have made sense, but it did not. And my dad was pretty spooked by this. Story four. When I was 13 and we were playing Mario Kart 64 on the Nintendo 64, my dad and my mom went to my dad's weekly game of billiards with his friends in the pub. We were old enough that we did not need a babysitter. Me and my sister below me were the babysitters. And there was only ever one rule. Never open the front door or back door for anyone, even when there is knocking. Even if it's someone you know, don't open it. Just talk through the mailbox in the door. And when there was a problem, we had the phone number of the pub. This was before mobile phones. We were playing with the four controllers and we switched regularly so everyone was playing and everyone in the living room was focused so hard on the TV screen it was like watching the World Cup final. I was on a very epic losing streak and from the corner of my eye I saw a big dark thing moving from the left to the right of the kitchen. I was so focused on getting at least one victory to get my brothers off my back I didn't look, only focused on the screen. When my sister said, who else saw that dark thing in the kitchen? From the eight children there, five saw it, including me. Little old me did not want to call dad and mess up and lose my babysitting privileges. Because it's awesome when you get the house parent free as a 13 year old snotling. So me and my two brothers sucked it up, got up and searched everywhere and everything under the beds, in the closets, bathroom, everything, but there was nothing. The windows were still shut, so we waited until dad got home, and he was angry that we were not in bed. So we told him what happened. He said nothing much, and put us in bed. That was a very scary night trying to sleep, and most importantly, I did not lose my babysitting privileges. This fifth story happened so many times while growing up, as far as I know, my dad says it's still happening. And it happened when he was little as well, as he grew up on that very farm. In the middle of the night, a very loud knock on the front door will happen, like one knock. Not every night, but maybe it's more than we know, because it's always just one. And it happens at different times. You need to be awake, otherwise you won't hear it. It's not just the old house making noises. I know every sound the house makes. It's a single knock, right on the front door. The same goes for the feeling of being watched a lot. Like there's something behind you, but weirdly not in the house, always in the barns or stables. And I think I've seen the person from my first story more times in that stable out of the corner of my eye than I care to remember. And they say animals can sense things. I think that's partially true. Like our farm dogs, they don't care, they go anywhere on the farm. We have four horses in the stables and they're never spooked. Only the cats can act weird. Like they go in and terrorize the mice in there, but sometimes they won't even go in. Even when you pick them up and walk them in, they are very weirdly meowing and making weird sounds. They feel uncomfortable. Anyway, 
Growing up with lots of children, those cats are the easiest and friendliest animals out there. They'll allow you to do anything to them, except when the barn is feeling creepy. Story 6 In our village, there is an old textile factory in the middle that is now closed. It ran from 1890 to 1978. Back then it was a ruin. Now it's been rebuilt into luxurious apartments. It's four stories high. But back then it was a very scary building and of course, the source of many scary stories. I was 17 years old. It was a Saturday night and me and two friends came from the pub back when the legal drinking age was 16. They bumped it up to 18 a few years back. So we had the brilliant idea to test our bravery and go into the factory. The place was forbidden. It was fenced off, but that did not stop us. We climbed the fence and went in anyway. Mind you, we did not have proper cell phones like now with their flashlights and all that. We made our way in in almost total darkness. I know this was a stupid and probably dangerous move. When we were on the third floor after walking in a good couple of feet, our hearts stopped. We heard movement very slow. And when we stopped, it stopped as well. So we sprinted as fast as we could. And we made our way in the dark towards the exit. We were all freaking out. I think the alcohol had a lot to do with it too. And my friends were like, is this real? At the same time, we saw in the distance four younger teenagers running. My friend ran after them and we followed my friend. We stopped the four boys and were like, were you guys just in the factory? At first they were scared of us, of course, like three older guys in hot pursuit of four younger guys, come on. But when they said that they were so relieved, we spooked each other out. I know it's not a ghost story, but for a second we thought it was, and it was still a good story to share. A few days later, I went in alone during the day just to see how it looked. And I discovered that we were very lucky. Because on the third floor right in the middle, it's collapsed on all the floors. And if you drop, you drop down three stories. So we were very fortunate that we stopped walking. This next story happened when I was 25. One of my sisters moved into a new house. It was very secluded. And there were only two houses there. And a party center that was closed during the week. On the weekends, it's open and it's pretty quiet overall. After a month, I could tell something was bothering my sister. So I asked, but she didn't want to share because she said it sounded stupid. But in the end, she told me. She says sometimes at night, you could hear what sounds like a little girl softly crying at the front of her house. And it was freaking her out. Because when she looked, there was nothing there. And it stopped when you opened the front door. She asked me to sleep over so that I could hear it as well, and I agreed. On the first night, there was nothing. But on the second night, I could hear it. And it was like she said. It was like a child crying very softly and slowly. I looked and nothing was there. I stayed for a third night and it happened again. And now my sister starts crying like she finally found her own place that she liked. And then this happens. Seeing my sister cry, I got annoyed at whatever was making the sound. So I opened the door and yelled, Can you just leave us alone? You're not welcome here. And believe it or not, since then it stopped. So I don't know what I did exactly, or what it was. But my sister still lives there to this day, and has never had any more problems. This is my final story now. But it needs some explaining. Me and one of my sisters planned a movie night together. I got a key to her house. She was not there, so I let myself in. And I looked at a text on my phone that she would be a bit later because something happened at the hospital she works at, as she's a nurse. So at one point I got bored and started to play with her dog taking pictures. And then the next day, I noticed this picture. No, it's not my reflection. The face is much bigger and I have a full grown beard and still do. In that room, there are no posters, paintings, TV screens, or anything with a reflective surface in that direction. And for clarification, it's not the same sister's house as the previous story. Still freaks me out. And I wonder what it could have been. I was a caretaker at a ranch. 
just outside of Yellowstone National Park. It was winter and my dog and I were the only two on the property. Overnight there was a large snowstorm. I woke up at 5am to my dog barking and a knock on the front door. I woke startled and waited for another knock before I got out of bed. My dog was now pacing and moaning. I stumbled to the door, opened it up and no one was there. Not a single track in the snow leading to the house in the fresh 15 inch of powder. My nearest neighbor was two miles away. I went back to bed and did not think about it much. Later that morning I woke up and my dog and I went down to work my other job as a ski technician. When I returned home later that night, my back door was open. Still the only tracks to or from the house were mine and the pups. I searched the entire property and still no new tracks. Searching the house, I found the bed had been slept on in the guest bedroom. That bed had been neat for weeks and there was still an indentation of someone's head on the pillow. This was an old ranch and I heard rumors that a few people had died in this cabin I live in. This is one of a few spooky encounters I had on the property. There was also rumors a few years back that the owner of this ranch, then a hunting lodge, had a daughter and that he did not treat her very well. Apparently she used to slave around the camp performing harsh requests for her father to satisfy his quests. She was seen, heard and felt by many guests staying in the ranch. We called her the lady in red. My cabin was not as active as some, but I felt a presence at times. One night I had a very hard time sleeping. I kept seeing something in my peripheral vision. While laying in bed in the dark, I saw something in my lazy boy chair in the corner of the room. I'm pretty even keeled, so I just thought of something else and soon fell asleep. I woke up a few hours later to my dog sitting up in the corner of my bed. I was not startled, so I calmly watched her. It seemed as though something was petting her. My dog was enjoying it and licking the air. She was awake and sitting chin high. After a few seconds of this, I sat up. The dog looked at me and something felt as if it passed right through me. The dog ran into the other room, wagging her tail as if she was running after someone and she wanted to play. I had the same feeling of something passing through me at another point. In the summers, I did not live in this same cabin. I lived in a room attached to the kitchen as I was the chef at this ranch. Between my kitchen and my office room were the employee dining room. As I switched off the kitchen lights, I was looking through the EDR towards my room. Just as I saw something distorted coming from my room right at me. I froze and this something passed through me once again. Just then the lights flickered. It's a very weird feeling and this was my second time feeling the same. The head wrangler's room had the most activity. This thing was nothing more than a prankster. He was always telling stories of something flying around the room. Once just after brushing his teeth, he left the bedroom and headed to bed. The toothpaste flew over his shoulders and landed on his bed. Pictures falling, electronics acting funky, all sorts of stuff almost every single night. I'm an army cadet in Canada, and about four times a year we do FTX, field training exercises, which is basically we go camping, usually at a scout camp, and do military-related outdoor training. This is about my first FTX. It was during one of our navigation exercises where we go around in small groups and follow coordinates to find a marker. Anyway, another cadet and I were in a group and we got totally off track and decided to radio our commanding officer that we had gotten off track and we were going to head back to camp to restart. As we headed back, we noticed a guy in the forest looking at us. Obviously, we were kind of freaked out. So as we were first year immature cadets, we decided it would be our best to look soldierish. While in our FTUs, we figured we could scare him off. As we go back to camp, we noticed the other group were back too. We were informed that there was a guy that crashed a stolen car by the camp we were at. The guy matched the description of the guy we'd seen. We had to stay in the small barn until they found him. 
And I don't know if you've ever eaten an MRE, but they have so much packaging. We had to eat it in there, and I was on cleanup duty afterwards. The most disturbing part is the guy was armed when they found him, and he was wanted on two murder convictions. One night, me and two friends were walking around at night in the fields around a small town in Michigan. Our destination was a junkyard, tucked away behind several fields, home to rustled out cars, semi-trailers and farm equipment. We were cutting through the fields to avoid the trigger happy farmers that live around there. We were just around there when we were foiled by a stream too wide to leap. It was late autumn and wet feet would be uncomfortable. So we backtracked into the adjacent field. From our corner of field, there was a tree line that ran east to west and southward and the land rose into a large hill. We stood for a moment discussing our options when my eyes were drawn to a large white boulder, seeming to glow a bit in the moonlight. It was around 75 yards away, and I was idly staring at it when it moved. It unfolded standing up, and it appeared to be a 10 to 12 foot bipedal thing, skeletal thin, pure white with long limbs. For the space of a second, it looked at us and then it took off. I think it was running but it may have been flying or gliding, honestly, I'm unsure. It crossed the field up over the hills, a distance of probably a hundred yards in two to three seconds in complete silence and was gone. Only two of the three of us saw it. And after a few minutes of incoherent gibbering, were we able to rationalize, explain, and figure out what the hell we saw and mutually decided it must have been an alien. A year later, I was at a party and the subject of aliens came up. I mentioned that I've seen an alien, and they say, yeah, let me guess, in Saranac, right? I confirm. We exchange mutual looks of awe, and he directs me to this Eric fellow who grew up in said town. Eric tells me that he has seen strange things there his whole life, lights in the sky, etc., but no humanoid beings. Fast forward another year and a half and I get a phone call from an acquaintance who was sitting up at work when he noticed a girl staring at him strangely. She eventually walks up to him and says, I feel like I need to talk to you. She proceeds to tell him that her friend's dad is the head of a vampire clan in a town near Saranac. My friend remembers the story about weird things in the area and asks her if she knows about anything in Saranac. She gets very defensive and eventually reveals that Saranac is a breeding ground for dragons. Yeah. To this day, I'm not certain if I saw a dragon, alien or a vampire, but I did a bit of poking around and I heard from a girl that lived there as a kid that she had seen random 15 foot scorch marks on roadsides and in the middle of fields. Weird. I used to be a delivery driver for a supermarket in the UK. A lot of our customers were in the middle of nowhere, and my last delivery for the night was a new customer I'd never been to before. I was already running late from all my previous deliveries, and I was still trying to find this house at 10.30pm. Even though my shift was supposed to finish at 10, I'm driving around the narrowest of country roads with nothing around me but dark fields and hedgerows, looking for anything that might be a driveway. I hadn't seen another car or person for miles, when all of a sudden I hear a loud thud on the side of my van like something was thrown at it. No trees or anything else around for someone to fall from, and I remember it specifically hitting the side. I look in my mirrors and out the window but there was nothing around me. Then it happened again, another thud on the side of my van. I drove back to the supermarket so fast and told my manager, that I couldn't find the place, and I had spent half hour looking to be fair. There was no house where the listed address slash postcode took me. And the thing is, if there had been a house, they would have called up and complained about not getting a delivery. So I was thinking it might have been a setup. I was never told that they phoned up to complain about their missing items, and they never attempted to re-deliver. I think they were contacted to provide better directions to their address, but we never heard from them. 
The weird part was that they had to place the order and pay for their deliveries first. And at the time, the shop had a minimum spend of £60 for deliveries. So if it was a prank, it was an expensive one. Also, the only thing around for miles were empty fields, and the only place someone could have hidden was within or behind the hedgerows. And if it was a human, they must have been hiding in a freezing cold hedgerow for over an hour, since my delivery was supposed to be scheduled at 9.30. This happened 12 years ago when I was 16, and I'm a female. Back then I lived in a small town where most people lived out in the country. Around midnight on a Saturday, I'm dropping my friend off after a night of hanging out. This friend lived way out in the country, and to get there you had to take a lot of winding roads with nothing on either side, and not many people travelled on them. There were a few houses, but most of them owned a lot of land, so they were majorly spread out. I always hated dropping her off at night, because driving back was always super creepy, probably because I've seen way too many horror movies and know what can happen in the middle of nowhere. But it was my turn to drive that night. After dropping her off, I'm being super careful, not only because of my irrational fear, but because of drunks who don't take curves very well. I turn left on the last small street before I get to the main road, and this street has two major curves that you have to take slow, since they are pretty wide and almost back to back. I'm coming up on the first curve, so I'm slowing down when I see three people dressed in all black, black sweatpants and black pants, walking and blocking the whole lane. It was frustrating at first, because I thought they were just teenagers, not thinking of the dangers of what they were doing. So I sped up and hurried past them, in the other lane before a car coming in the other direction hit me. As I'm passing them, I look out my window to catch a glimpse of the idiot teenagers' faces, and I noticed all three of them are wearing the same creepy grey skull mask, and they all stared at me as I passed. If it were close to Halloween, I would have passed it off as someone getting in the spirit, but it was around May. The weird thing about the situation was that it didn't even seem like they were trying to run me off the road or cause me harm. They didn't even look behind me when I first pulled up on them. The whole situation was too weird that I called the police. They called me back soon after, and told me they sent someone to the exact location where I described and said they found no one walking on the streets or even on the side. What creeped me out about this, is there was nowhere for three people to have hidden, because the street had open land on both sides. There were also no side streets that they could have turned on to evade the cops. They had to have been picked up by someone or had a good place to hide. Either way, I know they were actually people and not something I made up. I'm not sure what those three people were up to. But I told my friend that if she wanted me to drop her off again, it needed to be before dark, because I never want to find out what their intentions were. I want to share one of the scariest photo shoots of my entire life, not only because of the creepy subject, but also the creepy guy. So last night, my model and I went to do some photo shoots that we wanted to do for a long time. Basically, I wanted dead girl in the headlights at night type of photos. It was 9pm, but already pitch black here. We found some deserted roads in the middle of nowhere, and began the shoot. We went through two outfits, and she started to change into a third. Then all of a sudden, we saw a car in the forest. There was a dirt road to the left of us, and apparently he got stuck in the mud and couldn't get out. We were waiting for him to get unstuck and drive wherever he wanted to drive, but it was taking so long we decided to go for it and shoot. She was still trying to change, which is not very easy to do in the dark and in a small car, so I decided to go outside and get my settings ready, so she wouldn't need to stand in the cold or rain for too long. As soon as I got out, this dude magically got unstuck and sped to the road we were on, so I hopped in the car and locked the doors and sat there for a moment. We were all a little scared, but still he could just very well have been stuck in the road and just got out. He pulled to the driver's seat where my model sat, like 10 centimeters from her car, and almost broke her wing mirror and looked into our car. 
We had this big butcher knife for photos, so she pulled it out from her bag and showed it to him. That's when he sped off. We decided to go the opposite way in case he decided to block the road or something, but we met a dead end and had to go back. When we went to the place, we met this creep. He was in the same spot, but trending to be stuck again. So we sped right past him and called the cops. Because we thought he could just be waiting for someone to offer to help him, and then harm them. So guys, please be careful with your surroundings, and maybe don't go taking photos on deserted roads. I live in an island, where most people live near the coast. But my childhood house is deep in the mountains. Imagine a house in the woods, but at the very top of a mountain. The house is surrounded by thick mist every night, like in a bad horror movie. And the woods around it start less than two feet from the outer walls of our house. Our closest neighbor is a 15 minute drive away, and five minutes away there's an abandoned house. I think it belonged to a distant relative that was abandoned over 40 years ago. There's no street lights, and there are all kinds of animals roaming the area. This is important to the story, because even though you couldn't see a group of 10 people hiding one meter away, you could hear absolutely everything up to a few kilometers away. If we saw a car's headlights, or heard a car approaching, me and my family would turn off the lights and hide. Don't know why, shy, antisocial, you name it. I think that's enough background to the story. My house is small and impoverished, but our family car was a good one. I didn't know much about cars, but my dad always said that without a really good car, we wouldn't be able to get up to much, especially living on a mountain. Also, there's currently eight people inside our house at the time, 11 p.m. So I'm at the dining table enjoying some cereal while I'm watching some anime, having the time of my life. The lights in the house were on, so nothing could be seen in the dark outside. There's a window in front of me that shows the front entrance to the house and the only road. When something grabs my attention, but I can neither see nor hear anything, that's when I thought I noticed a human silhouette outside, but it didn't move. So I just ignore it. It could have just been a trick of the light. I'm watching anime, enjoying my cereal, when I feel something moving at the other side of the window. And this time, the silhouette was waving at me. I felt my heart jump out of my chest and I froze. The person outside waves at me, as if they're trying for nobody else in the house to notice him. After maybe 10 seconds in which I'm just looking at him with a spoon halfway to my mouth, he decides to call out, Hello? I need help. My parents hear him and approach the window, which made me sure I wasn't looking at a ghost. The man outside starts telling a story about how he got his car stolen at gunpoint and needs help. My parents are surprised that nobody heard his footsteps or a car or anything. So they whisper their theories amongst themselves. For the mysterious guy's story to be true, he had to have been mugged more than a mile away, get his car stolen, and then walk for half an hour in the dark through the woods following the dim light of our house. My parents still decided to believe him, and they offered to call the police. Our visitor begs to say the stupidest thing he could have. Don't call the police, I don't have a gun. My parents stay silent for a while. The guy outside knows he's messed up, but proceeds to make his request. Can I get a ride downtown? My dad nervously chuckled and gives him an excuse. He mentions the time, the fact that he felt the guy was lying, and that he already called the police anyway. This is when my favorite part of the story begins. I stand up from the table shaking and go to a closet, even though I can't see the guy's face. I know he's following my actions. I get two machetes that are about half my size and run to another room. I was terrified, and looking back, I probably took away the only weapons my parents could have used to protect themselves in case of an altercation. I open a door to the room where me and my siblings sleep, and they were watching some silly show. 
and their hyena laughter came out. My sisters are so loud and my youngest brother is four, that their laughs are angelical by day and demonic by night. I signal at them to shut up, and so they do so, joining me and my parents in our fear. We hear in silence as the guy says, It's okay. If you can't help me, I go to the next house. So my dad replies, There is no next house. You should wait for the police here. I don't need police. I'm good, said the stranger. This goes back and forth. The guy is now in good shape to walk an hour down the mountain to reach downtown. My dad offers a rusty metal tricycle from our porch so that he can go downtown as a joke. The guy accepts and grabs the tricycle. I assume he just wanted to leave with something, as this tricycle is over 20 years old and definitely does not work. We hear the screeching of the tricycle for a few seconds as the stranger struggled to be able to ride it, and then it stopped not too far away from our house. It seemed like he stopped, and we didn't hear any footsteps that indicated the guy had left. After trying to identify if he was still on site, to no avast. My dad calls the police. We wait in silence, looking at the road from the front view. Fifteen minutes later, the police get there. Amazing time back home, heroic even. And as soon as the red and blue lights show up, they illuminate the entire road up to the abandoned house. The tricycle is still on the road not too far away. The police claim not to have seen anyone on the road, which is the only road in the mountain. If the guy kept on walking, they would have definitely seen him. So they just took a look at the woods with a flashlight and called it a day. The cops were clearly freaked out by the eerie look of the house and did not stay more than five minutes. Nothing else happened that night. I slept with two machetes under my pillow, which I remember angered one of my sisters. We have no idea who the person was. No carjackings were reported the next day. And even though a lot of weird things happened around my house, we never saw the guy again. It's pretty obvious he was trying to steal our family's car, but there were a few things we could never understand. Where did he come from? Where the hell did he go? And if his story was true, he had the worst luck in the world. I think the situation was interesting because I think about his point of view and our horror night turns a bit comical. I mean, imagine this, you go to rob a house, turns out the people inside speak calmly. I don't know how much criminals encounter this as they try to intimidate or deceive. There's a scrawny looking mute kid that tries to be sneaky and grabbing some machetes and then hides in the darkness in the house. There's children's laughter coming from the non-visible rooms from the house as he could see the doors, but the inside of the rooms were geometrically impossible to look in through the windows. I think we were lucky to outcreep the creep that night. I don't see any other reason for the guy to back out from his plan. The guy clearly had a gun and bad intentions, not to mention his ability to ninja walk through a forest where we even heard wild cats walking around. Also, no neighbors or witnesses to hear anything. You guys have a good night. Remember not to let strangers in. And even though I won't, since I never really saw his face, let's not meet again. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I do hope you enjoyed tonight's video. It is actually a little bit longer than most, most regular videos anyway, because I just love this topic so much, and I really wanted you guys to get the most out of it. I really enjoyed tonight's stories a lot. If, of course, you liked them, be sure to let me know. And fun fact, some of these stories were the first stories I ever narrated. I, uh, I went back to when I first started the channel. Very, very first stories I ever got permission to use. And thought, you know what? I'm going to revive some of the classics, because those videos have barely any views, and the vast majority of you probably haven't gone back to listen to them. And I think I've improved a lot over the years. And I really wanted to do those old classics some justice. So if you had listened to them before, I hope I did a better job now. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my wonderful members and patrons for their continued support of the channel. It really does mean a lot. So thank you guys. But for now, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome. And I'll see you in the next one.